think we would like to. I, w I think we would like to get uh, tonight's program underway. I hope all of you had plenty of time to enjoy the delicious refreshments uh, that were brought here by Marcy Schoenfeld and her friends. So yay, Marcy! They were great. Thank you. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Susan LaPerla, the Programming Director at the Library, and it, it is such a pleasure to be co-sponsoring this program with the Jewish Historical Society. This is either the fifth or sixth program we've done together, and they've all been really wonderful, as this one will be as well. So I am glad you were able to be here tonight, and I hope you enjoy being here tonight. And with that, I would like to invite Elisa Kaplan, who's the Vice President of Programming for the this is the Historical Society to come and say a few words to you. Thank you, Susan. I'm going to move this flower just for one second. And then we'll, um, I would like to say a very special thank you and a big round of applause to the New Canaan Library for co-sponsoring. <laughs> it's, it's a delight to work with you uh, in your beautiful space and your, your uh, many resources, both on the shelves and in the form of the people who work here. Aw, yeah. Um, so my name is Elisa Kaplan, and along with my co-sponsor in crime, Marcy Schoenfeld. She's the food, I'm the silk flowers. Um, <laughs> We are the programming vice presidents for the Jewish Historical Society of Fairfield County. And isn't this a gorgeous day? Finally, finally. Okay, so many people are going to say something about spring, but let me be the first to wish you a happy Passover, happy Easter, and happy Holi. Holi is an in Hindu holiday um, that celebrates a colors and love. Gotta love it. Okay, and I do have to have one little shout out to Yukon for both the men and the women's basketball team. Yay, national champions. So we are delighted to have three sponsors for this event. Um, I've already introduced Susan LaPerla in the New Canaan Library, Al Kaprowski, who is the head of the Polish American Cultural Society. He is the person who helped us get all of these pictures on the walls, and uh, they are on loan from the Kosciusko Foundation of New York. So when Al comes in, we'll introduce him and thank him personally. But now I'd like to present the president of the Jewish Historical Society of Fairfield County, Ava Weller. Good evening. So there are a few little things that might overlap because we didn't co coordinate our remarks. But um, I do want to say what a lovely spring day it is. And it's very special to be here at the New Canaan Library for a program about Ar Arthur Schick, who made New Canaan his home. We also wanted to thank the uh, New Canaan Library, of course, so I'm thanking you as well, and uh, Al Kaprowski and the Kishko Foundation for um, a making it possible for us to have these lovely reproductions. And in the back, if you haven't noticed, Al actually uh, lent us three of his very small, um, they're prints, but they're original prints, and they're in the back in a frame uh, on the table. So if you haven't had a chance to see them, the colors are really quite, quite beautiful. Um, it is. Um, so I hope you've all had a chance to look at the, uh, the display. And if you haven't, there'll be an opportunity at the end. I also want to thank uh, Marcy and Alyssa for coordinating yet another thought-provoking program. And thanks to, to those who help with the food and the arrangements and to David Kaplan for presenting. Some of you may not know that this fall of uh, 2014 is the JHS's 30th year and that the Bridgeport Jewish Historical Society is not now part of the Jewish Historical Society of Fairfield County. I hope you will celebrate with us at a special event on September 14th. All are welcome, but if you're not yet a member, you may want to consider becoming one to take full advantage of our new membership offerings. Please take a look at our membership brochure 
uh, which it was on the table in the back, and consider joining us or volunteering. We ask that you sign in so that you can receive our emails and snail mail announcements, or uh, you can visit our new JHS website for any updates. We will hold a special membership event this spring, which I'm sure you will not want to miss. Uh, also on your chair, there's a, a membership. Um, the blue is for membership, and the other is our upcoming programs. The JHS maintains the only Jewish archive in Fairfield County, and it's located at 990 Hope Street in Stanford. We welcome donations of memorabilia, artifacts, and photographs. We continue to collect stories and memories about local history through our oral history project and are now recording Jewish veterans from all wars with the Veterans History Project, which is connected to the National Archives. The JHS Lending Library is located at the Stanford JCC with a wide selection of Jewish books for all ages and houses an extensive Holocaust collection. We also now offer DVDs on Jewish themes for all audiences. While you are there, if you go to the JCC, there's also a display case in the entrance, and we have rotating exhibits there. JHS also holds monthly book talks, usually at the JCC and also in the community, and makes available a traveling exhibit with photographs going back to the 1600s when Jews were first in the area. Of particular note is a, a news article about a shocking event which took place here in New Canaan. JHS also has materials to help you gather genealogical information about your families through its Heritage at Home program. And of course, we hold engaging programs on different aspects of Jewish culture monthly. We, we really do have something for everyone. Alyssa will now uh, share about the society's exciting upcoming programs and introduce her special speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Ava. I'd, I'd also like to um, do a special welcome for students who are here from the literature of the Holocaust. Hi, wave, welcome. They're from New Canaan High School. Right, right, right. That, that's why we invited them so we can say our, our mean age is, is, is quite a bit lower. <laughs> I have a few commercials. Um, we have some upcoming events. Um, on Monday, May 5th, if you'd like to get up close and personal with some real Israeli soldiers, they'll be here in town, Sahal, um, our Sahal program. They'll be members of the IDF. They are touring Fairfield County for a week or so, and they will be at the Harry Bennett Library on Vine Road in Stanford at 3.30 in the afternoon, and all of you are welcome to come. They're there to say hello, to tell you who they are, and answer any questions. Well, not any questions, but a lot of them. Okay, so that you're all most welcome. That's free and open to the public. Um, next month, our program will be right here in this room. Um, we are delighted that Elisa Solomon is going to come speak about her book, Wonder of Wonders, which is a cultural history of sunrise, sunset, of uh, Fiddler on the Roof. Anyway, so she's, gonna, she's written a book about it, and it's a Sunday, May 18th at 4.30 in the afternoon, and Susan will be back, and we'll be back, and um, food, at well, food at four, okay. <laughs> Marcy will be here with food at four. Okay, we also have a book talk at the JCC Library in Stanford on Wednesday, May 21st. Oh, no, it's, I'm sorry, that's at the Harry Bennett Library. Um, usually they're at the JCC, but they're at the Harry Bennett Library on Wednesday, May 21st at 2 p.m. Sandra Meltzer, who's very uh, well respected in the community, is reviewing The Storyteller by Jody Picoult. But the good thing about our book talks, you don't have to read the book. <laughs> Just come. Uh, that's, this is the best of all possible worlds. Come, have a cup of coffee, hear all about the book, and you'll decide if you want to read it. OK, I have a few special announcements now. One, uh, please turn off any cell phones or any other electronic devices, except for pacemakers. 
Okay, okay good. Um, uh, let's see who we have here tonight besides the new Canaan High School, besides whatever. If you knew Arthur Schick or someone in his family, please stand up. Uh, okay, David's going to introduce him. Okay, thank you, and we'll, we're so we're going to find you afterwards to get the real story because obviously um, we haven't met him. Now, if you have a piece of chic art, a book, a magazine cover, whether it's a real or I mean an original, they're all real, or a reproduction, please stand. Okay, yay. Okay, we thank you. We tried to get chic Haggadahs here tonight for you to buy. Not that one, of course, but um, the reproductions. Since Passover is four days away, yikes, um, they're on back order. So um, anyway, good. Okay, so now we're, now we're ready to find out about Arthur Schick, and it is indeed a pleasure to introduce my own very special speaker, someone I know very well, my husband, David Kaplan. Okay, this is Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Army retired, David Michael Kaplan. He's originally from Hendersonville, North Carolina. He graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point. He served honorably in the United States Army Signal Corps for over 21 years. Uh, that included a lot of fun places like Vietnam, but it also included a teaching assignment at West Point where he taught literature and philosophy. Um, after his career in the military, he became an international IT policy and technology consultant to NATO, uh, the U.S. and other European governments. And if you want to know about Poland in the 1980s and 90s and 2000, you want to talk to David. Okay, after that career, he became a computer executive. Eight years ago, he came to Stanford so I could get a job. And we are now in our 15th home. It's a pleasure to introduce <laughs> David Kaplan. Well, thank you, Lisa, for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> and uh, I will say, <laughs> it's almost all true, and that which isn't should be. <laughs> well, it, it is indeed a pleasure to be here today. And I want to add uh, my wish to all of you for a joyous and meaningful Passover, Easter, and spring season. What a terrific turnout. Uh, you've heard a number of introductory remarks and words of welcome. No doubt the subject of Arthur Schick, his life and works, has created quite a buzz. Um, before I actually get into it, though, I want to introduce a special guest. Uh, Julian Padowitz, will you please stand up? Julian is a nephew of Arthur Schick. So uh, let's give a round of applause to, to Julian. Um, and Julian has the distinction of actually, as, as uh, in his much younger days, um, being in the Schick household and act actually watching Arthur Schick draw his art. So after the presentation, I strongly suggest you seek Julian out to get the first-hand story. Okay, well, I'm here to introduce a special artifact. I think some of you have seen it beginning here. Oh, Al Kaprosky, are you here? Al, please stand up. You've been introduced in your absence, but let's give Al a round of applause for the Polish American Cultural Society of Stanford. Welcome to you, Al, and thank you for all your support in, in bringing this uh, about. Um, but those of you who have not seen the Haggadah, please come up afterwards and take a look. Uh, this is one of the original signed <laughs> versions. We're going to talk about it towards uh, uh, the, the latter part of the presentation, but I just did want to bring it to your attention now. So, Arthur Schick, Polish, Jewish, 
American artist, lived in New Canaan. How's that for local interest, huh? <laughs> He's one of us. But before we do look at that artifact, that the magnificent Haggadah, we need to put everything in context. So I'm going to focus quite a bit on background. Please stay with me, because I think you're going to find this an interesting life story. First, my involvement. I perhaps, as some of you, had been aware of Arthur Schick as, as artist in a rather vague, general way. Indeed, Elisa and I had been given this copy of the Schick Haggadah with an embossed silver co cover as a wedding present by the rabbi that married us on April 12th, 1970. Oh my God, <laughs> the anniversary's coming up this weekend. <laughs> I better get in gear. <laughs> Uh, so last year, about this time, I was asked to present a few background remarks at the Stanford Jewish Community Center at what has become the annual Jewish Historical Society display of this Sheikh Haggadah. I did the research, read, and studied, and wow, I was blown away. And that's an understatement. The response to my introduction was similarly revelatory for those who, like me, uh, had a rather superficial understanding of Schick's works. Of course, there were those in the audience, as I know there are here tonight, who had a much deeper understanding, and they could only smile knowingly while probably thinking to themselves, well, of course this is terrific stuff. What do you expect? <laughs> so those of you who fit that category, please feel free to jump in. If you have anything to add, I'm sure that we will all benefit from your insights as well. The, the ensuing discussion last year proved fascinating and thought-provoking, hence the decision to present to a broader audience, which is you. So at last, we're ready. Shall we jump in? OK, let's do it. I've entitled my presentation, as I've got here, Arthur Schick, Art in Service of Humanity. Why? Because this is the overriding theme so powerfully expressed through all of Schick's art. The reason is that Arthur Schick's art was not simply art for art's sake, and I know many of you have heard that phrase before, it's a, it's a, a famous phrase. Although his work certainly stands tall on its own merits, it resonates much more deeply. As we continue, the force and the power of his art will become clear. Indeed, if we keep this theme in mind, we can better appreciate the motivation for and, con and continuity throughout the range of his individual works. So the basic question, who is Arthur Schick? I have his years here on, on the slide. Well, at the most general level, we could say he was a graphic artist. He was an illustrator, a stage designer, a caricaturist, political satirist, and activist. But as with most truly gifted and influential people, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. And so we need to consider how all of the, his talents coalesce to produce art in the service of humanity. So here, I want to put everything in context. I want to talk about the world of Arthur Schick, the politics of Schick's art, the styles and techniques of his art, and finally, we will get to the Schick Haggadah. So let's begin by looking at the world of Arthur Schick, the world in which he grew up. Here we have a map of Poland uh, showing the boundaries in 1921. Schick was born in 1894 of upper middle class Jewish parents in Wutz or Lutz, Poland, depending on the way you want to pronounce it. Lutz, Lutz. Lutz. okay. And Al, and, uh, if we want to be true to the Polish, how would we say it? Lutz. There we go. <laughs> so we have a, a range of pronunciations. Let's take a look at the geopolitical backdrop for a moment because I think that this is very telling. Now. All of you will recall World War I, what year did it begin? 1914, right? So Schick was a young man of 20, right in the middle 
of all this last until when? 1918. So certainly World War I was a major factor in his young formative years. Some of us may not be as familiar with the Polish-Soviet War, which went from February 1919 to March 1921. Does anybody know what that was all about? Yeah, exactly. It was an armed conflict that pitted uh, Soviet Russia and Soviet Ru uh, Ukraine against the uh, Second Polish Republic and the Ukrainian People's Republic over control of an area equivalent to today's Ukraine and parts of Belarus. So, uh, yeah, certainly it followed from the Soviet westward offensive in 1918, uh, the, the whole Bolshevik situation. The Treaty of Riga was signed in 1921, which ended the war and set the eastern Polish border as shown here. Now, what's interesting is when you look at the eastern extent of it, here's Minsk. So when you, when you think about uh, what's happening now with the Ukraine and Belarus, think about that within the context of the Poland that uh, Schick grew up in and also the, 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 the different ethnic groups that are lumped together within the confines of the national boundary. To put it uh, in, in contrast, here we have the Poland of Schick's time, 21, and the Poland today of 1924. Um, just to, to mark on the map, you can look where Breslau is now, in, was then in Germany, and now, of course, in Poland. Similarly, the free city of Danzig then, modern city of Gdansk today, Bialystok then, and Bialystok today almost on the border. So the geopolitic was different then. This was his world. So what about uh, Lutz Poland? Let, let's talk about it for a minute. Lutz was an industrial center about 100 kilometers west of Warsaw. And what's interesting was the rapid growth. In, uh, in, in Schick's time, it was a, a fairly large city but uh, from a hamlet of 767 people in 1820, it grew to a city of 670,000 a century later. Huge growth. But what I find even more fascinating, that the percentage of Jews stayed rather constant at roughly a third of the total population. Uh, indeed, uh, Lutz was the second largest uh, concentration of Jews in Poland. Uh, it attracted Jews from throughout Russian Poland and uh, the Tsarist Pale uh, of settlement. And Jews established retail and other uh, businesses, eventually breaking into textile manufacturing uh, as well. Uh, Jews dominated retail trade, and by the eve of World War I, Jewish entrepreneurs operated more than half of the city's factories. Well, that gives us some, some background into that story. But the point is that uh, Arthur Schick did not grow up destitute. His father, in fact, was one of those textile uh, factory directors. And so he did have, to a degree, a privileged up upbringing. What I'm showing here is Piotrowska Street, the main thoroughfare, uh, then, and in fact, uh, now, it, uh, the, the, this street was revitalized in the 1990s, very long. It's almost five, five kilometers in length, one of the, the, the largest uh, in, in Europe. Um, and you can see that uh, a lot of hustle and bustle. We're, we're talking uh, about an urban environment that Chick grew up in, um, in spite of the fact that German forces, of course, did occupy Lutz in September 1939 and a series of anti-Jewish measures, and I should point out uh, anti-Polish measures as well, uh, ensued by which Jews were stripped of their businesses and possessions and forced to wear the yellow star, uh, the yellow badge, and limited Jewish residents in 1940 to specific streets uh, in the old city of Lutz in the adjacent uh, Baluti Quarter. 
as I'm showing here, the areas that would later become the ghetto. But for, for Arthur Schick, this came a bit later. He had already left Poland by that point. The fact is that up until uh, the, the, the mid-1930s, Jewish life continued uneventfully and many prospered. Arthur Schick's father, Solomon Schick, was one of the Jews that broke into the textile manufacturing, as I said. And not only did Arthur have a privileged upbringing, but his father could support Schick's artistic uh, studies and training. And he did study in Paris and Krakow. And after studying painting in Paris and visiting Palestine in 1914, he was drafted into the Tsar's army in World War I. But I should add, he, he deserted. <laughs> so that gives us an indication early on of, of where his head was. So what I want to do now is talk about the politics of Schick's art. We have an understanding of the world he grew up in. We understand that he grew up in a world of great political and, 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 and military tension, uh, factions fighting against each other, uh, ethnic groups in proximity that uh, perhaps naturally would not have been. So let's look at the politics of his art. Between 1919 and 1920, during Poland's war against the Soviet Bolsheviks that we talked about earlier, he served as artistic director of the Department of Propaganda for the Polish Army Regiment quartered in Lutz. During this period, he developed his strong sense of Jewish identity, his love for Palestine and Zionism, and his, an empathy for oppressed anywhere, and certainly was involved in, uh, understood the role of political activism and the role that his art could play. And given uh, the backdrop of war in his life story, it's easy for us now to understand why. What I'm showing here is a poster that he did uh, during his uh, term as uh, artistic director. And what, is, what strikes you about that? What about, what about all that blood and gore dripping from the sword? Is there a visceral impact to that? I think so. And this is something I, I want you to pay attention to as we go through here because the impact of his art, whether for, in support of a cause or against it, it does impact you to the heart. Now, even though uh, he had not been to America, he resonated very early with the American ideals, American democracy. Uh, as the, the, the slide shows, he often said, art is not my aim, art is my means. Here we showed uh, his means against uh, a Soviet Bolshevik. Here, in commemoration of what he thought was important to him in America. So in 1921, he and his family had moved to Paris where he lived, studied, and worked, but he traveled extensively in remain while remaining very connected to Poland. In 1934, he traveled to the United States uh, for exhibition of his work, including a series of 38 miniatures commemorating George Washington in the Revolutionary Period. And I'm showing one of the plates here. Now this is something that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, and that is his role as one of the first anti-Hitler cartoonists. Uh, this is something that I, I think those of us that, that grew up generation before me, and it was still in the air when I was a young child, and we can see it. Um, and I love this quote. With the rise of Nazism in Germany, Schick said, the painter of books wants to reply to the wall painter. And I think that really puts it in perspective, both in terms of his attitude towards Hitler and Nazism and his own role. Now, supposedly, the Fuhrer put a price on the head of his nemesis, Arthur Schick. Such was the impact of the work that Schick did. Now, I don't have a copy of it, but one of the, the first works uh, that Schick did 
directed against Hitler was a, a pencil sketch in which uh, Hitler is shown as a, a modern day pharaoh side by side with a pharaoh of antiquity. And of course this theme we're going to explore a bit more when we actually get to the Haggadah. Now on this slide uh, I show a work that Schick created less than a year before the war ended. Now I don't know if you can see the detail on it, but that's Schick behind the desk and he's finishing off a still struggling Adolf Hitler, Hermann Goering, Heinrich Himmler, and uh, Francisco Franco as they attempt to escape much like the winged creatures uh, flying above Schick's head here. In the wastebasket are the defeated figures of Mussolini, Laval, and Pétain, whose regimes fell as a result of the Allied invasions. Now this one, and I, I might point out, oops, went a little bit too far. No, I guess we got it. So um, at the same time as uh, he was doing the anti-war posters, he worked for two years on his Sagata, and in 19... Uh, 37, took 48 paintings to London hoping to find a publisher to do the work justice. However, and, and this, this I find fascinating as well, Schick had injected his anti-fascism into his art, done things like putting a swastika armband on the Egyptian overseers beating the Hebrews, um, and a Hitlerian mustache on the wicked sun in, in the plate showing the four sons as part of the Passover story. I've got that plate here, and you can see the figure, uh, Bavarian costume, mustache. Okay, maybe not so subtle what the illusion is. I think we get it. He ultimately had to remove a lot of his uh, not, not more, more overt Nazi uh, uh, symbols, but the subtle things like this remained. We'll get into that in more detail, but for now, I just wanted to point out that uh, the Haggadah includes elements that are so emblematic of the politics of Schick's art. Schick was also an activist for a Jewish homeland in Palestine. He had moved from London to New York in 1940 after the publication of his Sagata, but to place the significance of the Jewish homeland to Schick in perspective, he reportedly stated that he experienced the happiest day of his life on May 14, 1948. What was that? Yeah. The, it was the announcement of the Israeli Declaration of Independence. Now, mind you, Israeli independence occurred just eight days after Schick was granted U.S. citizenship. But for him, as important as that was, it paled in comparison to having uh, the homeland in Israel. Now, he commemorated Israeli independence by creating a richly decorated illumination of the Hebrew text of the Declaration, as you see here. And t talking uh, before this presentation began, I was bowled over the Breslows from New Canaan came up to me and said, we've actually got a signed uh, original copy. Would you like me to bring it in? And I said, well, yeah, <laughs> please do. And, and so here it is. Uh, th there's no way that the projection can do justice to what this actually looks like. The colors, uh, the intricacy of the art, the way it blends in with the calligraphy of the text. Uh, if you have a chance afterwards, you can come up and look I would, though, like to spend a few minutes looking uh, at some of the detail here because it also will give us some insight uh, into uh, why this is not just art for art's sake. So let's look first at the top. You see the two, uh, two lions up there. Uh, no, let me get back. Here we go. All right, we got them. Now, that particular pose, does anybody know what that's called? The, the lions of Crouch? That or the lions of Judah in the Jewish context. And you'll see this theme repeated throughout Schick's art. 
very important to him, and certainly for a Declaration of Independence, yeah, pretty appropriate. Now let's look at the bottom. You see three figures there. Anybody want to guess who they are? We've got Moses, right? And we've got Aaron and Ur. And the reference here is to uh, Ezekiel, uh, the passage where Joshua defeats Amalek, the enemy. And uh, if you recall the passage, Joshua is successful as long as Moses keeps his arms raised. He's the protector. The three of them are the protectors. And so I think we can uh, rightfully interpret this as a reference and also to the fact that we have the homeland, we still have those protectors. Now, on the left margin, we have a Palestinian soldier, now Israeli soldier. And on the right margin, what do we got? Yep. We, we, we got, we, mm -hmm. So the, this, this is the, 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 the new homeland. It's being settled. This is what meant so much. And in the lower left-hand corner, a figure, any idea who this might be? Well, this, this is Ezekiel, and he points to the declaration symbolizing the fulfillment of his prophecy of Israel's return. So there we have it. We could go on in a whole lot more detail, but I think you get the idea. Now his support for uh, uh, a Jewish homeland Palestine is not surprising. Uh, his response to Israeli independence uh, is really just an outcome of what he had been doing over his lifetime. When World War II ended in 1945, Schick devoted his political energies to winning uh, popular support for the creation of a modern Jewish state in Palestine. And he dramatized this conflict in Palestine in terms that many Americans could understand. And if you look at the, uh, the, 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 the painting at the top, the struggle for freedom and independence against the British tyranny. You have the Mayflower and an illegal immigrant ship a message against the British. If you look at the paintings at the bottom, you can see that uh, this focus had been from his earliest days, a Palestinian pioneer in 1914, Jews in Palestine, the well of uh, Jacob, Paris, 1925. Now, Schick often called himself a soldier in art. In fact, this news clipping reports that Hitler considered uh, Schick one of Germany's most dangerous enemies, and as I said earlier, had reportedly put a price on his head. Now, to emphasize how widespread his influence was, consider this slide um, showing an array of magazine covers that uh, Schick had illustrated. And these are mainly from the 1940s. Uh, you see Collier's Time. So you see uh, uh, Jewish-oriented publications, American Hebrew, uh, on and on. Now, we could have put many more if I'd exp expanded the time frame, but this gives you a sampling. Now, after Schick immigrated to America in 1940, he quickly gained renown as a book illustrator and graphic artist. He illustrated numerous works of literature, magazines, articles, and beautiful documents, such as a richly illuminated Declaration of Independence. <clears throat> he generally felt good about his adopted home country, saying, at last I have found the home I have always searched for. Here I can speak of what my soul feels. There is no other place on earth that gives one the freedom, liberty, and justice that America does. And much as the Israeli uh, Declaration of Independence, a lot of symbolism. We don't have time to go into that now. But to represent the scope of his work fairly, I should point out that not all was political sci satire and political tribute. Here we see illustrations for Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales, including an extremely evocative plate from the angel carrying away the baby. Clearly, his childlike ima imagination was just as powerful 
as his diatribes against political injustice. He also handled contemporary novels as well as classics like the Canterbury Tales. He, uh, he mastered styles and visual, visual symbolism of other cultures and faiths. Uh, here we have the Arabian Nights entertainments, Persian miniature painting, fantastical scenes such as this from uh, Flaubert's The Temptation of Saint Antoine, sensitivity to Catholic mysticism. However, when all is said and done, his fame for most of us rests with his anti-Nazi cartoons and caricatures. Schick's drawings were very important for the American war propaganda effort and in recognition for his services in the fight against Nazism, fascism, and Japanese aggression, Eleanor Roosevelt said of him, and I love this quote as well, this is a personal war of Schick against Hitler, and I do not think that Mr. Schick will lose the war. <laughs> I mean, think about that. She also dubbed him One Man Army, and that became a, a famous nickname. Um, you'll recall that we already uh, talked about his own uh, self-description as a soldier in art. Other famous quotations um, are, art is not my aim, it's my means, and I am but a Jew praying in art. So how does an artist use his craft as a soldierly means? How does a Jew pray through his art? Let's consider these questions as we investigate the techniques that Arthur Schick used. How many have seen this, this before? Yeah, and as a matter of fact, uh, it, pretty, pretty famous. And I find this absolutely bone chilling. And l let's investigate a little bit and, and maybe we can explain why. Um, we all know who it's depicting, but who is he being depicted as? Any guesses? Yeah, that. And ma many observers uh, interpret as an image of the Antichrist a satanic image, and, and I can understand that, because um, in that interpretation, in Christian prophetic literature, the Antichrist, the terrible enemy of Jesus and mankind, was expected to appear before the end of the world and lead Satan's forces in the final struggle between good and evil. Uh, now, dating back to Rome, the figure was often identified with a particular individual, and according to this interpretation, Schick portrays Hitler as the personification of evil under whose twisted cross Jews and non-Jews are enslaved and murdered. Uh, now, while many of his ideas and messages are visual, there are two sentences in this illustration that show another aspect to, to this art as not just art for art's sake. Now, I'm going to focus in on this banner at the top of the page. It's in, in Latin, but it says, Today Europe, tomorrow the world. Okay, that gets our attention. But let's look at Hitler's hair. Do you see something funny about it? It's Latin. Ve victus, woe to the vanquished ones. So you can take almost any of Schick's works of art with a magnifying glass. He was a miniaturist, and you will find things like this. You talk about the, the hidden Easter eggs or the things that are not totally visible. But there's just meaning at so many different levels. Now, there's also something going on in uh, Hitler's eyes as well. Can you see what's going on there? Skulls. Yeah, that's it. So as I said, satanic illusions, bone chilling for me. So what do we get out of this particular uh, painting? or poster, well, to me, it clearly illustrates his effective use of political caricature, satire, and allusions to historical and religious motifs, the techniques that Schick uses throughout his world, his work. A much better rendering of this is, uh, is on the wall, one, one of the uh, uh, prints that, that Al brought, so you can take a look, look at it later on. It's entitled A Madman's Dream. Uh, and this nightmare scene shows Hitler enthroned with the world in his lap. Uh, he's surrounded by his German stooges. Do you recognize any of the, uh, the people there? Murray. 
Yep. You got Gehring. Yep. 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 Got got all, all the players there, and you, you see the the two uh, figures in chains. Uncle Sam, and John Bull, right, Britain, uh, symbols of U.S. and, and Britain in, as enchained slaves, and crushed under Hitler's foot, perhaps not quite as obvious, is a stere stereotypical subhuman Jew. Now, we could go on and on. We could look at literally hundreds and hundreds of his works, but you get the idea. I don't think we need to, to beat it to death. So what I want to turn to now is what artistic style did Schick use to illustrate the Haggadah? But before I go on, let me ask the question. Do I need to explain a little bit what the Haggadah is? I know not all of us come from the Jewish faith. Okay, so uh, for Passover, with uh, the exodus of the Jews from slavery in Egypt, um, there is the story. Uh, the Haggadah is the telling. And each year, we are commanded at this time to retell the story of the exodus from slavery to freedom so that subsequent generations understand that story. And over time, that story has been embodied in a booklet, uh, which is called the Haggadah. It has a long tradition that I'll get into a bit later, but suffice it to say, many, many renditions, many different styles. Um, but what Schick did was to take it, in my mind, to a new level as a work of art, while also, as we mentioned before, taking the techniques that he had developed in his political art, the caricature, the satire, the allusion to historical and religious motifs, but combining them with long-standing traditions that we'll get into next of manuscript illumination from the Middle Ages on, as well as heraldic imagery, you know, the stuff of Arthurian legend. Uh, so let, we'll leave it at that for now. Now, what do I mean by manuscript il illumination? Can anybody hazard a guess what, what that involves? Absolutely. Uh, usually very vivid art that surrounds the text. Very often, if it's done well, it has some meaning in relation to the text. Sometimes you'll just see an illuminated first letter of a word that embellishes both the page and provides some artistic interest. Um, and uh, very often borders around the page or marginalia, again, to provide additional interest. Now here we have two examples of medieval illumination that are quite famous. <coughs> uh, the, uh, the first one uh, is uh, the Winchester Bible. You can see it's uh, from the 12th century. And I've got two uh, uh, copies from, from that uh, Bible. On the left is a series of panels, scenes from the life of David. Now, when you look at it, and if, if you were to come up closely, you would see it's almost in a cartoon fashion where each individual panel is a point in time, staccato style, telling a story. We have to fill in, the, we have to connect the dots. Uh, but it's a technique that worked really well because you had the written narrative to connect the dots for you. But I want to focus in on the lower right portion of the panel. Whoops. Let me uh, get back here. There we go. I've just bl I've blown, blown it up. And uh, there you have uh, a scene where uh, David is uh, got his head buried in his cloak. Why? He's mourning the death of his young son. So very evocative. Now on the left, an example of what I was talking about as a beautifully illuminated letter G. And the meaning here, well, that's the first letter of the first word on the page for God. So it's not just embellishing the page, it's also uh, embellishing the meaning of the text. 
I want to turn now to a work by uh, Arthur Schick that is more indicative of um, the heraldic tradition that I also mentioned. Now, this is a painting uh, that he did um, of King uh, Jagieto of Poland. It's one of a series uh, that he did honoring the nations allied against Nazi Germany and their leaders. And at first glance, it appears to be a traditional, albeit superbly rendered example of heraldic art. I mean, I, I could just sing King Arthur come charging out of the background. <laughs> it's that sort of thing. But uh, closer examination can yield some insights into the innovation that Schick brought to this, this style of art and his creative genius. Let's start by looking at the shield, uh, which I'll blow up. There we go. Uh, this, this is the shield of Poland. And what do you notice about it? What's, what's the figure on it? Yep, yep. It's, a Pol it's, a, it's an iconic Polish eagle. Uh, yep, it, 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 it's been around for about 700 years, but Schick has innovated a little bit. Heraldic art is traditionally two-dimensional. If you think back of the uh, paintings you've seen, they, they tend to be fairly flat. I mean, this almost looks chiseled in, the, in its relief. And also look at the talons on the eagle. They actually extend out beyond the confines of the crest. So again, he's bending some of the, 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 the trappings of heraldic art without quite defying it. He's, he's taking convention and modifying it. Now, in the lower left quarter, and I think this is important to understand, uh, what do you see? This is under uh, King Jaquetto's foot. Yeah, yeah, what we've got here is we have uh, a crashed uh, a German shield. Uh, we've got a Nazi helmet underfoot, swastikas captured and destroyed. Not so subtle a message. We can get it. Now let's look in the upper right-hand corner here. What do you see? Okay, yeah, we've got a Polish warplane. Uh, its wings are red and white uh, quartered shields showing the symbols of Polish military aviation, uh, which are also repeated on the, uh, the borders of the painting, as you can see there. And under the airplane is a mounted Polish soldier uh, carrying an army regimental flag. Now these are anachronisms, they don't belong in, uh, in heraldic art, but they do convey a very strong image, and I think precisely because they're not what you would expect. So again, just one example, but I wanted to give you an idea of the, the background of heraldic art and what it meant to Schick. Before we get into his Haggadah now, I want to uh, talk about some early uh, illuminated Haggadahs. The oldest complete manuscript of a Haggadah dates to the 10th century, although the story was told long before that. One of the most famous uh, is um, a book called the Rylands Haggadah. I've got a page of it on the left, it's considered one of the finest, written and illuminated in Catalonia, 14th century. And it's an example of the cross-fertilization between Jewish and non-Jewish artists uh, within the, media, the medium of manuscript illumination. I think part of the reason why uh, you see some of the same techniques as we did uh, in looking at uh, the, the Bible that we looked at a few slides back. This is the preparation of the Paschal Lamb and the marking of the door, part of the Passover story. Now on the right, another famous Hag Haggadahs, and a, one of the visual models that Schick evidently used on, for his was a 15th century illuminated Haggadah, now known because of where it resides in, at the Library of Congress in Washington uh, as the Washington Haggadah. Now what strikes me about this is the absolute economy of both uh, the uh, 
the art and the illumination and the placement on the page. Uh, the text remains central. But I want you to keep this in mind and compare and contrast these two as we look now through uh, Schick's take on it. So at last we're here. Thanks for sticking with me. <laughs> we're going to talk about Schick's Haggadah. So Arthur Schick illustrated it. And by that, we're talking about illuminated capitals. We talked about that. Calligraphy. He actually did the, the Hebrew lettering at, to a high artistic level, as well as paintings. We mentioned that he had done 48 color plates, uh, not counting uh, the marginalia, the illuminated letters, and small drawings on most pages. Cecil Roth, who is a, a famous uh, Jewish historian and writer in his own right, uh, edited it. It was published in 1940 in London. And you'll recall that uh, Schick had a heck of a time finding a publisher because of all the Nazi illusions, many of which were removed. It's printed on large size vellum with Moroccan leather binding. Uh, who can tell us what, le what vellum is? Anybody know? I had to look it up. It, calfskin, actually. Yeah, I, I mean, it, I mean, sometimes we use the term interchangeably with parchment, but I, the, the best way for me to understand it, it's just a very, very high quality uh, because a, a young calf, uh, extraordinarily complicated means, it's not tanned the way that uh, parchment would typically be done. It's, it's honed with a knife, sometimes with a pumice, uh, to an absolute gloss, extremely thin, extremely expensive very valuable, but for Schick, the main uh, point was the way that it took ink. And I, when you come up and take a look at a page from the Haggadah itself, you'll understand what I mean. Uh, there's no way that this projection can do it justice. Um, but uh, it's a rather long book, 114 page, pages. I mentioned the 48 color plates. The initial uh, publication was uh, a series of 250 signed and numbered copies. This is one of those 250 signed and numbered copies, and it's a relatively early numbered one. Uh, the value today, uh, that's uh, eye popping, forty to sixty thousand dollars. I was looking on uh, on the web the other day. There's one for sale uh, for sixty six thousand. You saw one for 77? Is it 66? Yeah. I don't think it's been a taker yet. But the point is, <laughs> we take good care of this one. Um, just a, a, a quick story uh, as to how we, how we got a hold of it. It, it just appeared one day um, at the Jewish Historical Society uh, Library, which is at the uh, Jewish Community Center in uh, in Stanford. Yeah? My note here for the Hebrew Bible is for a thousand years. Found it. Absolutely. It was at the library, out with all the other books, and she picked it up and read it. She said, oh my God, there she is. She is. Uh, I mean, can you imagine? It had been dropped off. Uh, it was duly collected when the library opened. Oh, it's a Haggadah. Let's put it on the shelf with the other Haggadahs. Uh, it, it turns out uh, the story, as I understand it, is that this was was a, a, a copy that, that Chick personally had in his house. And when his estate sold, the new owners of uh, the estate identified it as a, a, a Jewish book and brought it to the library at the J Jewish Community Center, figuring they can use it. So there. So when you clean out your attic, be careful. <laughs> Look at what you got. Yeah. Now, in, in the few minutes that are remaining, I want to go through some of the pages. Uh, are you still with me? Can we spend a few more minutes? OK, great. Now, Schick actually did several different dedication pages. Now, why should that not surprise us? This is not art for art's sake. 
there's a message here. Uh, he's got one with a, a dedication that I'm showing to King George the, the, the VI, who was the then current uh, king in England. He's got one in French, on and on. You think maybe he wants to send a message? Well, let's take a look, because I find this just wonderful. Uh, now, there is a clear Zionistic statement throughout the Haggadah, as you would imagine, and by Zionistic, I mean, you know, uh, pro-Israeli or, or Jewish homeland in Palestine. Uh, so let's look. Now I'm going to focus on the, the lower right edge of the page. Who's that? <laughs> okay, and, and what about his dress? It looks sort of funny to me. It's sort of a paramilitary outfit he's got on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it could be. He's got a pallet uh, with his brushes. He's got a quiver. Soldier in art. You think maybe these brushes are his weapons? I think that's, that could be one interpretation. The, uh, the, uh, the dedication itself at the feet of your most gracious majesty, I humbly lay these works of my hands, showing forth the afflictions of my people Israel. Is he talking past tense or present tense? I think he's talking present tense. And, 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 and we can show some evidence why. Let's look on the, uh, the, the left hand, I'm sorry, the, the bottom margin. I'm blowing it up. What, what do you think this is showing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'll give you give you a hint. We we have this fortress here. Star of David, crown. He, Hebrew says Zion, Zion, Palestine. You think? <laughs> I believe so. Uh, who who do you think these people are? Yeah, refugees, and what do we got here? Ship, bringing them in, we hope, and maybe not guarding to prevent them come in. We don't know. Uh, certainly, if you remember what was going on in England at this time, you could make a case that Chick was urging the king to end restrictions on Jewish immigration to Palestine that bar Jews from safety and their Zion homeland. Um, let's take a look at a couple other things. Whoops, there we, okay, we got it. Let's look on the left-hand margin, right in here, I'll blow that up. Okay, what do you, what do you see there? Coat of arms, right. It, it's uh, the British quarter shield. It's showing England, Scotland, and Ireland. Um, and above it is the crest of England. Uh, yep. Right. And the English crown has a crowned lion standing on it. Up here. There's a better image on the wall here. Uh, you can take a look afterwards. So that in and of itself maybe isn't telling us a whole lot other than the fact that, okay, this is a dedication of the King of England, right? Um, but so let's look where, do you see anywhere else on this page where we have lions? Right above it. Right above it, and at, exactly. And also at the top right margin, I'm going to blow that up. Another lion of Judah as contrasted to the British lion and the British flag uh, in the Jewish national colors of blue and white, uh, which was used on uh, Zionist flags long before the state of Israel, so we're not talking anachronistically here. So uh, there you have it. Um, there's more, but I'm not going to go into it. Suffice it to say, uh, the more you look at this, the, the more you're convinced, man, there's a message here. He's not just being nice <laughs> to, to King George. <laughs> there's more going on. 
This is the frontispiece. Uh, it's, it's, it's the first illustration you see when you open up uh, the Haggadah. Now, t typically, uh, at, at a Seder, and we have a copy on the wall here. You can take a look. It's a, a bit bigger. Uh, the father, the, the head of the household, traditionally, sits, sits at the table. Uh, he directs the Seder, the telling of, 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 of the story, the order of the Seder. And uh, you see the family surrounding the table. Um, and when you look at the expressions on their faces and what they look like, uh, okay. Some of them maybe could be refugees, maybe, maybe not. Some of them very well dressed. Uh, certainly the, the table is set in what appears to be the finest uh, china and silver. Um, and everyone seems intent. Uh, I don't want to go into a whole lot of, of, of detail here, but I'll point out a few things. Uh, the copper decanter at the front bottom is for hand washing. There's a picture of a seven-branched candelabra, which would have been in the temple in Jerusalem. The words say Passover Haggadah. Note the heraldry images at the top. Uh, you've seen this before, the crown, the lion, the castle, the coat of arms. Now, even though you can't see it, <laughs> and I love this, there uh, is uh, a Latin phrase written around that crown. And I'm sure that uh, Schick was not a U.S. Marine, but it says Semper Fidelis. <laughs> we have a Marine in the audience, so I had to add that. Now, I, I, I had to do some research to find out why. I said, okay, I, okay, most Americans understand Semper Fi, all right? But Poland, Eastern Europe, what's going on there? Well, it turns out the motto has been used as, at least as far back as the 16th century. I didn't know that pertaining to schools, cities, families, you see on family crests, and military units. Okay, I'll buy that. Today, in Poland, the motto is um, referenced uh, mainly in connection with the Polish-Ukrainian War. Go back to the beginning of our presentation. It, it all comes back full circle. Uh, so, when you think of the Polish-Bolshevik situation, now we're talking uh, the Haggadah, we have uh, this Jewish family uh, sitting around the table, we want a homeland in Palestine. That message, at least subliminally or hidden, is on most pages of the Haggadah. Now this is just a gorgeous Seder plate in the shape of the Star of David. Uh, who, can, who can tell us what a Seder plate is? Generally, on the Seder table, um, there will be a plate, uh, sometimes with little side dishes um, uh, on which are placed ritual objects uh, that are part of the telling of the story. Bitter herbs to remind us of uh, uh, the, the tears of uh, the hard work as slaves, eggs, spring, uh, lamb shank, etc. cetera. Um, but chicks, to me, brings added resonance, just the beauty of the design. I mean, thinking out of the box creativity here. Now in the center, uh, Schick has made a place for maror, bitter herbs, to remind us of the bitterness of slavery and oppression. But I want to look primarily at the scene in the background. What do we have? We have a, looks like an Egyptian overseer who is uh, beating. Yes, yeah, oppressive. Uh, That's why I know, it, it's, I, it, I, I didn't have quite the resolution to. Mm -hmm. But what I want to bring to your attention is this armband on the Egyptian overseer. Does that remind you of anything? Yes. Yeah. Yellow you got it. I, originally, there was a swastika on this but when she couldn't find a publisher who was willing to take a chance, I mean, Britain at this, that time was still looking for appeasement. They really didn't want to <laughs> exacerbate the situation. Uh, he painted over, as I said, a number of the more overt symbols, and, and this is one of them. 
but for us today, and perhaps even uh, at, then, we get it. We understand what he was trying to do. And again, at the top, you've got the crown. I'm not sure what to make of the, the, the two men at the top. I mean, I don't know whether that's uh, meant to indicate uh, garb from biblical days or, or what. Uh, but in any event, I find it a, a very striking quest, a, a piece of work. Here we have uh, the blessing over uh, the, 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 the cup of wine, the Kiddush, uh, begins with the word Baruch, blessed. And I just want to show you what he did with, this is the Hebrew, Baruch, the letters of the word. So, okay, so think back. We, 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 we looked at the medieval uh, illumination of letters. Well, now he's illuminated an entire word. But the resonance here is not just the letter that is symbolic, but the word itself. But look also what he's done with the, those letters. They are surrounding the family. They're encapsulating the family. Blessing, blessed. I don't think that's coincidence. Again, at the top, two lions of Judah. We've got the crown, the word kiddush or kiddish. Uh, other symbols, ritual objects. Uh, a man saying the blessing over the wine, the kiddish. I like this page a lot. The four questions. What we're talking about here is that the tradition of the Passover Seder, the telling of the story using the Haggadah, is that the youngest son asked the four questions, starting with, what's the first one? Why is this night different from all other nights? And the father answers. I mean, what's going on here? Well, it's a setup. <laughs> it's a way of getting into the story. We said that the purpose of this yearly rendition is so that the, the, the next generation understands. We have the children's interest. Uh, and so um, what I wanted to point out here is we have the letter, the Hebrew letter mem, the M letter, which is the first uh, letter for the word what. Mm -hmm. So th there we go again. This page, uh, the, the bread of affliction, uh, we're commanded to uh, eat matzah, unleavened bread, to remind us that we were slaves in Egypt. We had to flee on a moment's notice. It wasn't time for bread, bread to rise, so we're eating these flat loaves. Uh, no yeast. And uh, again, I think just we, we could go into detail. I, in the interest of the time, I'm not. But it, it to me, is just a, a very beautifully rendered drawing. What do we got here? We got baby Moses. Yeah. This is from uh, the section of the telling of the story. We were slaves in Egypt. It depends, uh, it, it, it depicts the passage when you, when you read the, the Hebrew text adjacent. She took him from the water. It sets the stage for the story to follow. So who do we see in this picture? Besides baby Moses, uh, we've got the handmaidens. We've got uh, Pharaoh's daughter. We've got Moses' sister Miriam and uh, mother uh, Jehobed, who appear to be hiding in the reeds, watching what's going on. Here's the four sons that we talked about earlier. Uh, now the tradition has it that we have to present the story in terms that our young children can understand. And not all children are the same. Uh, we have this guy who is the wise son. And he appears to be dressed in uh, <laughs> in a typical religious Jewish student garb. 
perhaps uh, someone that, that Schick would have envisioned in his time. We have this guy at the bottom. Who do you think he is? Yeah, I think he's the simple son. He's the one who really can't do anything. Uh, we might call him a shlamazel, a nebesh, I don't know. It's not that we have to dummy down the story, but we, <laughs> we have to present it in terms that he can understand. Now, I'm fascinated by this guy. This is the son, whoops, let me go, I didn't mean to do that, let me go back. I'm going too far. Here we go. Okay, the lower, the lower left. This is the son who does not know how to ask. It's not that he isn't smart. He just isn't relating. Now, to me, the way Schick has this guy dressed, I could see him as a pioneer, perhaps an intellectual, a secular Jew, someone who went to Palestine or wants to go to Palestine? How do we draw him into the Seder? And of course, the guy at the top, we've already talked about. Here we have another one of those not so su subtle uh, allusions uh, to Nazi uh, Germany. The Four Sons. Rendition uh, or depiction of the Egyptians trapped in the Red Sea. Uh, I find this very evocative. Um, appears to be a dove flying overhead. Moses with twin rays of light emanating from heaven down. The swirling motion, I find it's almost a visceral experience to look at this. It really does grab you. Now here's a, a take on an illuminated letter that I, I find interesting. Uh, the Hebrew L, Lamed, which is the first letter of Leficha. This is part of the Hallel part of, uh, we give thanks, part of uh, the Haggadah. Well, well here he has just illuminated the first letter, but so beautifully as it transverses the page and the word Hallel at the bottom. Hallel or Hallelujah. The Cup of Elijah tradition has it that uh, we set aside a place for a prophet Elijah uh, and that he is going to visit us at a point during the Seder. We actually open the door and invite him in. Again, beautifully rendered a lot of symbolism that we really don't have time to go into. And lastly, I wanted to show this prayer of thanksgiving from Psalm 136. Uh, you may recall Psalm 136 talks about the march through the desert. A group of people attack the Israelites like snipers. Their leader was Amalek. We talked about Amalek earlier. Uh, the words uh, at the top of the page uh, mention his name. Jewish tradition has it uh, that uh, some of the evil figures in our history uh, are descendants of Amalek. Uh, Haman during Purim. Here's another example that I think you could interpret as subtle anti-Nazi sentiment. The prayer is thanks in, uh, of thanksgiving refers to being saved from Amalek. Okay. It, it's been a whirlwind. We've covered a lot of territory. There's a lot we haven't. But in closing, I just want to say that in 1945, Arthur Schick and his family moved from New York to New Canaan, where he lived until the end of his life in 1951. A lot of his important work was produced here. We ought to feel honored that he lived among us. From what I can gather in talking to those of you who either knew him or had relatives who knew him, these were very happy times for the most part for him. While he remained a steadfast, loyal supporter of America, he did not shirk from his deeply held convictions, particularly his unflinching advocacy for human rights. He was very sensitive to the plight of blacks in America, 
uh, suggesting the analogous situation with the Hebrews in ancient Egypt and delivery from, from bondage to slavery. Now, there is there's one dark episode that I feel I should mention. Despite his immense contributions to the American war effort and to American culture in general, his outspoken views caught the attention of the House on American Activities Committee at the height of, of McCarthyism. And I find it especially ironic uh, that the committee began investigating Schick, who they suspected of being a member of an organization they believe served as a communist front. Schick was obviously distraught. He protested that he was not connected with any communist organizations. But a few months after the investigation began, he died of a heart attack at age 57. Relatively young man. Yeah. Well, that, <laughs> I'm sure that had nothing to do with it. <laughs> but the, the point is, what he was able to accomplish in his short span of years, just phenomenal. The immense popularity Schick enjoyed in the United States' his lifetime gradually flagged after his death. Um, but there's currently a resurgence of uh, interest in Schick and his art. Uh, the Arthur Schick Society, uh, founded by Erwin Unger, a reform rabbi and Schick advocate, is an excellent resource for anyone interested in learning more. Uh, Google it, it'll pop right up, Arthur Schick Society. Uh, they have reproductions of his art as well as many articles. Uh, and in fact, they have reproduced as closely as possible the original Haggadah and in, it, in, 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 in its uh, best edition, it can be yours for a bargain, $18,000. But shipping is only $5, so there you go. <laughs> um, now, let me, let me end with this quote. Um, it, it's uh, by Cecil Roth, who was the editor, so maybe he wasn't totally objective, but I think he speaks for a lot of people and a lot of critics that, that I've read. And he said, to call Arthur Schick the greatest illuminator since the 16th century is no flattery. It is a simple truth which becomes manifest to any person who studies his work with the care which it deserves. And I suggest that we all do so. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Okay, isn't he terrific? Um, I'd like to introduce, ooh, yes, Al Kaprowski. Uh, we want to thank you for making these prints available to us and invite you up for a few last words. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I was late. I was at another affair at the Ferguson Library in Stanford. So, so, so I got here as fast as possible. I, um, I think that uh, Schick was a fantastic person. Uh, Schick, uh, um, Julian Padowitz here and I are longtime friends. And uh, Julian uh, introduced me to uh, Schick's, his aunt uh, and uh, Schick's sister. Um, Oh, many years ago, uh, my wife and my wife and my family uh, purchased the old um, um, beach club in, in Japan Point uh, that was a Jewish club, okay, at that time because the Jews could not get into the other, uh, other clubs in Stanford, okay? Well, um, my father was a policeman, and um, uh, we were down um, uh, down uh, town one day. I'm in the real estate business and have been for 54 years. And um, I see um, uh, the owner, uh, and uh, I said to him, we well yelled across the street, are you interested in selling? Well, we became the owners of the Ocean View Beach and Tennis Club, which used to be the Clearview Beach Club, and we integrated it. So we, we had a Jewish Christian club, and it, it, uh, it, was, a, it was a fantastic um, 25 years, 
and uh, we had a, a great time, and um, it, was, it was wonderful. I'd just like to uh, introduce the president of the Polish American Culture Society, Jerzy Karwowski. <clears throat> And my wife, Patricia Kaprowski, who is the, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, secretary, uh, financial secretary of the Polish American Culture Society. <laughs> and I want to invite you all to uh, May the 3rd. May the 3rd is Polish Constitution Day. And Polish Constitution Day, uh, the Polish Constitution is the second oldest constitution in the world. The first was the American Constitution. And the second is the Polish Constitution. And it, um, it um, uh, survives till today. And um, you are all, you who are of Polish heritage are part of it. And you are brothers and our sisters. And the, we want to invite you to come. It's May the 3rd. It's going to be 6 p.m. It's going to be at the Ferguson Library. We're going to have a, a speaker on Polish Constitution. Uh, we're going to have Polish uh, uh, young people who are dancing, older people who are dancing in regional costumes. And uh, we hope you will we'll also have some, um, some uh, refreshments. And we hope that you will all take the time to put that on your calendar, May 3rd, 6 PM. Thank you very much. And we have a little birthday gift for Al of last weekend. He got a year younger. Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> so please take time to um, come up and see the Haggadah, the original work, or, or visit through. Talk to Julian if you like, or any of the people here from New Canaan or each other. Thank you. Happy Passover. Happy Easter. Happy Spring. We have one more announcement. Hi, my name is Bob Weinberg, and I collect Schick, but I collect his book plates, his ex Libris. Now, if anybody has any or knows of anybody that doesn't want them, please let me know, okay? Thank you. <laughs>